Selamat malam. Kajahau. So this evening here at uh, Vihara Ekayana, I'm very happy to be able to give a talk on uh, Buddha and his teachings. And I'm very um, grateful for the Bhantes here, Venerable Arya Maitri also, and the other Bhantes, and also some of your uh, members, and an old friend of mine, Mr. Surya Di Dionanda, to invite me through Buddhi Hartono uh, to uh, come here and give a couple of uh, Dhamma talks. It is not my uh, Pertama Kali in uh, Indonesia. Suda Sering Datang Kesini. Tapi, tapi, tidak tahun bahasa Indonesia per um, to give a Dhamma talk. <laughs> so therefore, I will uh, continue in uh, English. The talk is about uh, the topic, Buddhism, is it a religion, a philosophy, or a way of life? Now, personally, I think that it is all three. It is a religion in the sense that uh, there is a founder, you know, Gautama, the Buddha, and his followers, Bhikkhu, Bhikkhuni, Upasaka, Upasika, then you have Vihara, Vihara, then you get the Tipitaka, the teachings of the Buddha, organized and handed down over many centuries. And then you have the uh, ceremonies that are taking place in the temples from the time of the Buddha already. So you have a whole history of an organized um, teaching, which is, uh, if you want to call it, a religion, um, because you have the temples and their ceremonies, the monks, the nuns, the bhikkhu, bhikkhuni, to lead the lay people. And in that sense, it looks like um, other religions. However, Buddha's teachings are not so much, um, you know, as other religions in some of the, or most of the world's religions, which are called theocentric, with uh, God at the center and uh, the human beings praying to God and uh, getting blessings from him. But in Buddhism, it is more or less a do-it-yourself religion, if you know what I mean. Uh, you are responsible for your own karma. You are getting the results of your own karma. You are the creator of your thoughts and words and deeds. And therefore, it is more a um, religion or a philosophy of uh, cause and effect. And also with the human being more or less at the center for the human being and by the human being. So, uh, Buddha, as a human being, he was born, as you all know, as a prince in the northern part of India or southwestern Nepal, what it is now, Lumbini, and born as a son of a king, Suddhodana, and growing up in luxury and having everything and more than he really wanted and needed, except that he did not feel uh, happy and he found that this materialistic existence is not enough. However much you may have, it is never 100% satisfactory. And unless your mind is at peace and uh, you have uh, found some balance and uh, peace within, um, these material things cannot satisfy you. So, in those days, the Buddha 
before he got enlightened, when he saw the kind of suffering in the world with uh, sickness and uh, old age and death and all the, what is called the frustration also of people, he was uh, looking for something that could give him real peace and happiness. And therefore he found that he cannot really stay in this palace in Kapilavastu, but need to go and find teachers who could teach him something higher, something to uh, really um, develop his mind and find real happiness. And then he went to the best teachers of his time, Ala Rakalama and uh, Ramaputra, they could teach him a kind of meditation which gave him uh, the uh, development of mind to focus his attention on one object and get one-pointed concentration and deep levels of absorption which is called dhyana and it went up to what they call the eighth jhana, the rupa jhana as well as the arupa jhana, he could manage and he could uh, actually master it very quickly. And then the teacher said, well, this is all we can teach you. There is no more that we can teach to you. And Siddhartha thought there must be something more because these states of jhana are just what you call conditioned states of mind. By suppressing thoughts and uh, concentrating on an object, internal or external object, and getting deep concentration on that, he was able to um, concentrate so deeply that some psychic powers also came to him. That means that he got uh, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and uh, reading other people's minds, being able to remember his previous lives, and uh, maybe other psychic powers such as going up into the air, levitation, and uh, things like that. But even there, he was not satisfied with that as the final goal. And he thought there must be something else beyond this. And therefore, when he was um, for six years uh, doing these ascetic practices, where he uh, started uh, fasting and eating less and less and less and less, and finally becoming so thin and so weak that he fell over when he was trying to cross the Niranjana river near Budgaya. He felt that, no, this is not the answer to my quest. There must be something more and something unconditioned that I can realize. So he actually sat down under that tree, which we now call the Bodhi tree, the Ficus Religiosa, and uh, thought to himself, I'm not going to get up from here until I find the final solution to the problem of Dukkha or unsatisfactoriness. And indeed, after a week of final meditation there, and after having accepted a meal from this lady called Sujata, um, the milk rice, which he ate little by little, and he gained some strength, he then uh, saw the uh, cause and effect, what we call the um, Paticca Samukpada, or the law of uh, um, interdependence. If this is, that comes to be. If this is not, that doesn't come to be. And um, this was becoming clear to him during his mindfulness meditation, putting his mind on the body, feelings, and the mind itself, and realizing 
the kind of characteristics of uh, life, both in himself and externally. So the um, realization of the cause and effect, he realized such as this. Um, he realized that all this process of becoming in samsara is due to what is called avidya or ignorance. And because of this ignorance, there is a kind of um, uh, existence or coming to be of karmic activities, what we call sankharas. Sankharas or karmic activities means based on volition, you do something, you say something, even you think something with a good mind or a bad mind, with kusala chetana or akusala chetana. If it is a good mind, you base your activities and your words and deeds on uh, generosity, dana, on loving kindness, metta, on uh, karuna, compassion, and on wisdom, prajna. Then your thought, words, and deeds become purified and become skillful, and they are good for yourself and for others. But if you base your activities on akusala chetana or unskillful intentions based on greed, hatred, jealousy and ignorance, then the results are going to be not good for yourself as well as others. They lead to suffering for yourself and others and also to the uh, elongation of your time in samsara. You make samsara longer and longer because of these uh, unskillful activities. Since probably you are not a bodhisattva who has made the, the vow to stay in samsara as long as it takes to become a samma sambuddha, um, usually you, uh, if you are based on those unskillful states, then um, you make the suffering and the samsara longer. So, the Buddha realized this uh, Paticca Samuppada, or the law of cause and effect, and the interdependence, uh, one way and also the other way. If there is no uh, ignorance, then there is also no uh, karmic activities. And when there are no karmic unskillful activities, then we don't really need to have a rebirth linking consciousness. If that is not there, then we don't get this Nama Rupa or this uh, body and mind. And if there's no body and mind, then you don't have these uh, six senses, no? Your eyes and ears, nose and tongue and body and mind. And therefore you don't get these feelings of happiness and unhappiness and no greed for the happiness and no aversion against the unhappiness. And therefore no need to be um, reborn also. There's no craving and no aversion and no ignorance. That means a state of an arahat. And so under this uh, Bodhi tree, by the way, the Bodhi tree or Ficus Religiosa is said to have a very special effect when a person sits near the tree. Um, the um, vibrations of the tree seem to stimulate the medulla oblongata or the pineal gland under your small brain. I don't know if there's any doctors or medical students in the audience, but you can maybe uh, try it out and see. Um, and so they say, even in the Encyclopedia in Belanda that I saw, um, that this Ficus Religiosa has a stimulating effect on our mind and our brain. So, that was the time of the awakening of the Buddha, and it seems that um, he found something that went beyond all these jhanas, beyond the conditioned mind, and he discovered what is called 
the unconditioned, the unborn, the non-dying, namely nirvana or nibbana. And um, apparently in that period that had not been discovered by anyone else. In that sense, the Buddha gave a different teaching than that those teachers before him. And therefore we can say that Buddhism became, uh, one, once people started following him and accepting his teachings, it became a separate kind of um, yeah, philosophy and practice and uh, way of life also, and in a way a religion. Uh, first of all, the bhikkhus, they were um, uh, going from here to there, from village to village, and uh, usually walking around with their begging bowl and not staying in one place. But, um, as you may know, before Buddhism, or around the same time as Buddhism, there was also another religion called Jainism, with Mahavira as the founder. And in Jainism, they believed that there is consciousness in everything, not only in human beings or in animals, but also in plants and trees and flowers. And um, they had already instituted what they call Chatur Masya, four months of retreat period, what we call Vasa, or rains period, um, for their monks. And um, therefore, they were asked to stay in one place during those days, because they thought if these monks are going around for alms, for the begging with the bull, they may trade on all these new plants that are coming up under the rain, and that's not good for them. So people started to build temples for them, and in the case of Buddha and his teacher and his uh, followers, the bhikkhus, and later also the bhikkhunis, um, they also, the people, started building um, temples for them. Even the kings of those periods, Bimbisara and uh, no, other kings, they started uh, giving uh, large pieces of land and building um, like uh, monasteries for the Sangha and asking them to spend the Vassa, the Vassana period there. And that tradition, of course, you know, is still in use in um, most of the Buddhist uh, traditions, Theravada as well as Mahayana, although the period uh, is a little bit different. In um, Theravada, we start the uh, Vassa in the full moon of uh, July and finish between the full moon of October and November, so that we have the um, what is called the Katina ceremony in that month of October, November. And in the um, Mahayana tradition, it seems that they start in April and finish in August with the Ulambana uh, ceremony. So uh, that is a difference. It is also probably because of the changing of the climate and the uh, um, shifting of Buddhism to other countries. Even in England now, you see, um, they, they don't have much rain in the summertime, actually, that is the best time to travel. And if you have to stay in the temple for three months, and then by that time it is uh, raining and getting cold and winter, then uh, you might as well stay in the temple uh, the whole year. Um, so, in some places like Amaravati, Achan Sumedho, of the, the follower of Achan Cha and his community, have introduced what is called the snow retreat. So, not rains retreat, but snow retreat. And they spend time meditating and discussing and teaching at the temple during that time, which is also quite a practical idea. So anyhow, Buddhism, it um, spread to many, many countries. Even though it started in uh, India um, with um, Emperor Ashoka in around the 3rd century BC, uh, he became a very, very uh, 
strong follower of the Buddha. First of all, he was a very cruel king, and uh, he had to have uh, meat and fish and all kinds of animals on the table uh, every day. Um, a very strong non-vegetarian. Um, and later on, he realized the Buddha's teachings of non-violence, and he uh, actually uh, became a follower of the Buddha. And not only a follower of the Buddha, also propagator of Buddhism and building 84,000 uh, stupas and temples all over his uh, kingdom. So in that way, Buddhism started spreading uh, all over the place. And India was already quite a large center uh, area. So even it went across to um, places like Pakistan, what we call Pakistan nowadays, and Afghanistan, Iran, and Turkey, it seems, and even to Greece. And um, on the other side, um, it went down via the sea route, via Vietnam into China, and um, also to Sri Lanka, when the son of Emperor Ashoka Mahinda took the Buddhist teachings to Sri Lanka and um, Sri Lanka became one of the very strong Buddhist uh, countries and um, it also went, of course, it went to um, what is the Myanmar and uh, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, also to Indonesia, Malaysia and um, in the north, it went another time to China overland via the Silk Road and also to uh, Tibet, then from uh, China to Korea and uh, Japan, and of course also to Mongolia and countries like uh, Bhutan, Nepal itself, where Buddha was uh, born although there is more Hinduism, there was more Hinduism than Buddhism. Nowadays, I think the Buddhists are realizing that Buddhism is slightly different from Hinduism and they see themselves as Buddhists. Earlier they were told Buddhism and Hinduism is the same. Agama Buddha than Agama Hindu, Sama Sama. <laughs> it is Sama Sama, it is similar, but it's not exactly the same. Yes. So, um, in that way, um, Buddhism has spread to many, many places. And then, in the last uh, century, especially the last 50 years, uh, it has gone to Western countries as well. Europe and uh, America, and even South America. Not much, but still it's growing. And also to Australia where Buddhism seems to be the fastest uh, growing religion of all the religions that are there. Not the biggest one, but the fastest growing. And in Holland also, apparently, that is the case. But percentage-wise, um, I don't know exactly in Holland how many Buddhists there are, but it is still not more than 1%. But it is still much more than there were before. And a lot of people who are interested in Buddhism don't always say that we are Buddhists, but they are very interested. And maybe they live like a Buddhist, but they don't say I'm a Buddhist. So it's difficult to count them. But anyway, um, Buddhism also, I think it was Einstein himself who said that um, Buddhism is the suitable religion for the 21st uh, century, for the modern world. And a um, lot of uh, people, such as philosophers and also psychologists and psychiatrists, and doctors also, find a lot in uh, Buddha's teachings and also in the practice of um, meditation and mindfulness especially, a way out of um, yeah, conflict and um, frustration and a way towards uh, inner peace and happiness. So in that sense, um, yeah, Buddhism is not so much in that case a religion, but more like a practical philosophy. Some philosophies, as far as I know, uh, may be very, very highly intellectual, 
but they are not very practical. And uh, in the case of Buddhism, it is uh, also highly intellectual, but it is also practical. One can put it into practice, into one's daily life. And therefore, when we say, is Buddhism a philosophy? Yes, but it is a practical philosophy. Like, for instance, the Four Noble Truths, uh, the Eightfold Noble Path, the uh, Paticca Samuppada, Law of Cause and Effect. A lot of those teachings, you can say they are a philosophy, but they also give you something to do, like uh, Sila, Samadhi and Panya, for instance, to observe Sila, to uh, develop your mind and to develop uh, wisdom. That's not just a philosophy that is sort of uh, in the air, but with the feet on the ground and something that you can do and realize for yourself. In that sense, the uh, Buddha's teachings as a philosophy is um, very good and um, also, you know, the Buddha said, you don't have to believe everything that I say. You don't have to believe everything that is written in the books or just because the majority of people believe it. But if you find that this is good for yourself and good for others and not against reason, then you can accept it. If not, you can reject it. So, since um, most of what the Buddha taught is not against uh, reason and it is good for yourself and for others, then people who really um, study it and practice it, they find, yes, this is something that is good and um, acceptable. Now, of course, um, as far as I know, in the, for instance, the Chinese uh, tradition in uh, like Malaysia and Indonesia, Singapore, and maybe also in mainland uh, China, in the earlier days, people did not study in um, the Buddhist teachings very much, but they went to the temple more out of uh, faith and uh, what they say, Pai Fo. So, yeah, Pai Fo. Yeah, so, uh, and then with the, you know, the, yes, like this, Pai Pai Pai. And then, <laughs> but not really knowing maybe the Four Noble Truths or things like that. So, um, now, especially the younger generation in these countries that I just mentioned, such as Malaysia and Indonesia, Singapore, and also in uh, mainland China, they are looking more for the actual teachings of the Buddha. So you can say, yes, Buddhism is um, an intellectual religion, but you also have room for uh, devotion. It's not that, you know, devotion is bad, but when devotion can be combined with uh, wisdom and knowledge, for instance, that is also what the Buddha taught, no? Develop um, sraddha, that is faith, and uh, balance it out with wisdom. If you have only faith, then uh, sometimes you can worship stones or trees or, you know, uh, buildings or uh, other kind of objects, but not really understanding uh, what you're doing. So, um, when the sraddha is there, it is a good foundation, but there must be some kind of understanding and knowledge and wisdom also to balance it. And um, the other thing that we should balance is the effort that we do in our practice, the energy that we put into it. Um, when one is uh, striving very hard and um, putting a lot of effort in it, but maybe the wrong effort, then the um, result will be probably um, what you call restlessness and frustration and not getting what you want. But if you um, um, balance it with concentration and calmness, then you may be able to um, 
have the right kind of effort and the right kind of um, uh, concentration and uh, fly like a bird with two wings. If you have only one wing, you know, you don't really, you cannot fly. So, it's just like the Sraddha and the Panya, the um, faith and the wisdom also are like two wings. This uh, concentration and uh, effort is also like a bird with two wings. By the way, do you know why some birds are standing on one leg? Have you seen birds like with a very long leg standing on one leg? Yes, like the heron. You know why? Why do they stand on one leg? No, no. Well, I'll tell you. If they pull in the other leg, they would just fall <laughs> out. <of this> <laughs> So this was just to uh, to wake you up. <laughs> so anyway, the the central factor in the teachings that has to be balanced is what we call sati or mindfulness or awareness, attention. Yeah, that is all. Um, well, the central teaching of the Buddha's meditation also is based on his Satipatthana Sutta, the teaching on the development of Sati or mindfulness. So, um, faith and wisdom they will also be important, and concentration and uh, uh, what we call effort. But the mindfulness has no factor that sort of counterbalances it. It's a central factor and you cannot have enough of it you can develop it. It's not an unconditioned thing, but it depends on your own um, effort and to see the need for it, that you need to be aware of what is happening in your body, your feelings and your mind, which can, uh, what we call, prevent a lot of problems. And also, um, the Satipatthana Sutta says, that it will purify your mind, it will purify you from greed and hatred and delusion, and it will eventually give you the um, result of the final liberation, if you practice it long enough. And the Buddha says, if you practice it for seven years at one stretch, or let alone seven years, let's say six, five, four, three, two years, one year, and even he goes down to six months, five, four, three, two, one month, and even to one week, depending on your paramitas, I suppose, on your previous practice and on your readiness to practice it, maybe also under the circumstances that you practice it. If you practice that sati for that period of time that is needed, then you can be assured of entering the stream and maybe even come to the um, uh, non-returner's state. And who knows, maybe also Arahat state, if that is what you want. This may be interesting also to discuss a little bit. Um, not everybody wants to become an Arahat, you know. There is a confession of what was his name, Saint Francis, I think, or somebody who said, Oh God, deliver me from all sins. But not yet. <laughs> and maybe, uh, may I become an Arahat? But not yet. <laughs> or, Maybe we can think, um, well, I chose the Mahayana, uh, what they call the Tatsun Tao, yeah, the, the, the Pusa Tao, the way of the Bodhisattva, yeah, which is different from the way of the Arahat. And there you decide that uh, even though you know that samsara is not a very pleasant place, of course some things are pleasant, but they're also unpleasant things. It's never 100% ideal. So it's a mixture of happiness and unhappiness. So it is not really worth 
uh, what you call striving to make the samsara longer, unless you say, I want to help more and more beings, more and more suffering beings, and as a bodhisattva, I don't mind how long it takes till everybody can be enlightened. That's how I will practice. Now, maybe Theravada people might say, mm, that is an impracticable uh, proposition. <laughs> it will never happen. Nobody, not, not all the beings will become uh, enlightened, you know. Um, it will be, it's a little bit like an unrealistic ideal. But still, it has, it has a very noble um, sort of intention, the unselfishness and the development of the paramitas, and uh, to strive for full enlightenment, whatever time it may take. It is not guaranteed that every person who takes the Bodhisattva vow actually becomes the next or the following uh, Samma Sambuddha. That is uh, not guaranteed, but still it's a very good um, practice. But the ultimate ideal would be actually to, um, yeah, to come out of samsara and to attain nirvana, which is supposed to be the highest happiness, the deepest peace and the greatest security. And completely an unconditioned something beyond which you cannot reach any higher than this as a human being. So, um, is Buddhism then a religion or a philosophy or a way of life? Well, if we say, if you study the Buddha's teachings and you go to the temple and you meditate, but not only that, if you also practice generosity in your daily life and you practice metta in your daily life, and you are kind to other beings and to suffering beings and try to help them, karuna, and if you have what is called um, sympathetic joy, that is mudita, and also if you can keep balance, what is called have upekha, towards other, you know, what they call the eight worldly conditions, happiness and unhappiness and gain and loss, and fame and blame and things like that. If you can keep balance and have upekha, then also you are practicing Buddha's teachings in your daily life. Now you, I think most of you are of Chinese descent. You may know that there were these two Chan masters in China, one of whom was living on an island and the other one was living on the land near that uh, lake. And one of them thought that he is much better than the other and that he has attained, you know, complete stability. And he wrote a little um, poem on a, like a calligraphy, you know. And, you know <laughs> I don't know exactly. Um, these uh, eight winds, huh? these eight great winds of happiness and unhappiness and gain and loss, they cannot, they cannot shake me, he said. And then he rolled up that uh, calligraphy and sent it to the other Zen master. And when the other Zen master, um, Chan master, uh, got it, um, he opened it and looked, he said, P. Mm. Now, I don't know if you know, well, maybe I don't pronounce it correctly. P, 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 P. <laughs> it means in English F A R T, if you know what that is. A small wind. <laughs> and he just wrote this P. And then he sent it back to the other Zen master. And that Zen master got very angry. <laughs> <laughs> completely upset him. And then the other one said, well, if a small wind like this upsets you this much, what about the eight winds, the great winds? <laughs> so, you see, um, sometimes when we are isolated in a hermitage or in the forest and we meditate, we might think that um, 
it is, uh, you know, we have attained something like that, uh, like uh, the end uh, result already. But when it comes to facing the actual worldly matters, then it is a different thing. Actually, Achan Sumedo also told once about his extension for his visa in Thailand. He used to get extensions, and once he went for an extension of the visa, and they didn't give it to him. And he became oh, very angry. And he realized, oh, I thought I had progressed more than this. But he realized, no, I'm not so far yet. But then he had to find a skillful means, I suppose, to get the extension. Yes. yes. So, um, basically, these um, three aspects of Buddhism, is it a religion, a philosophy, or a way of life? I think we can combine them. And not everybody is so much interested in the higher philosophy, maybe Abhidhamma and things like that. But, you know, we can at least uh, study a little bit, like Dhammapada, for instance. The Dhammapada is like a handbook for daily life. If you open it anywhere, there always will be some kind of advice which is good for your uh, daily life. And uh, you don't have to go into the deep philosophy, it gives something practical that you can apply yourself and maybe in the family life uh, also. So in that way, it is uh, not only for scholars and for monks or for intellectuals, um, in a similar way, people used to think that meditation is only for the monks in the Aranyas, in the uh, forests, and not for the lay people. But nowadays, especially since Goenka and other teachers have brought Buddhism closer to the lay people, and people are starting to do retreats, one week retreat or ten days retreat, um, they have realized that it is possible for uh, anybody who is really interested and who is willing to uh, sit that long for a retreat, um, that it is possible to practice meditation. And um, maybe it's not everybody's uh, cup of tea to meditate, but um, uh, it is not impossible. And also, there was a belief especially in Sri Lanka in the early part of the last century, 20th century, that um, people cannot, uh, and even these days, even monks cannot attain the Arahathood or Nibbana. And that idea was there very strongly, and that you have to wait and wait for many, many lifetimes, be born as a human being or as a deva, and again and again, uh, offer so many uh, pariskaras to the Sangha and uh, go up, oops, sorry, up and down, up and down between the, um, that was a moment of no sati, I suppose. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, up and down between the, what is it called, the Deva Loka and the Manusha Loka, the heavens and the human world. And finally, be born in the time of the Maitreya Buddha, and then listen to his Dhamma, and then attain uh, Sota Panna Sakuragami Anagami Arhat. But that looks to me as a very long way, and it is also not guaranteed that we will meet the Maitreya Buddha, is it? It is not like um, when you buy something, uh, no good money back, you see, that kind of guarantee. <laughs> so, um, it may be a better idea that if you feel that it is worthwhile to follow the Buddha's teachings, uh, this Buddha has already taught everything, and every Buddha seems to be teaching more or less the same for Noble Truths. So why not make use of this precious uh, human life that we have, and being born in the time that Buddha's teachings are there, and then 
study them and practice them and realize one, as much as possible for oneself. And you know, since we are not guaranteed that we attain that arahanthood, it is good to do meritorious things. Punya, what is called uh, in Pali. Uh, uh, punya is different in, in Indonesia, you know? Pun yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, uh, uh, the meritorious things, kusala karma, yes. And therefore, um, let us hope that uh, having come together uh, like this and listening to the Buddha's teachings and um, gaining, hopefully, good states of mind and uh, good energy, what we call kusala shakti, uh, that uh, accumulating all this, that uh, we will share this also with our um, protecting deities and also with those who have passed away to the other world that they may be uplifted and may be free from suffering and eventually uh, also attain the final liberation of Nibbana. So um, I will just chant that and you can chant along with me. Akasatta chabhumatta deva nagama indika punyang tang anuvoditva tirang rakham tuloka sasanam Akasatta chabhumatta deva nagama indika punyang tang anuvoditva tirang rakham tudesanam Akasatta chabhumatta deva nagama indika Punyang tang anumuditva tirang rakhang tumang paranti Atta bata cha ami sambatang punya sampadang Sambi deva anumodantu sambha sampati siddhya Atta bata cha ami sambatang punya sampadang Sambi bhuta anumodantu sambha sampati siddhya Atta vata cha amhehe sambhatam punya sampadam Sambhi satta anumodantu sambha sampati sintiya Idang me nyati nang hotu sukita huntu nyatayo Idang me nyati nang hotu sukita huntu nyatayo Idang me nyati nang hotu sukita huntu nyatayo Thank you.